and welcome to another episode of Conversations with Darren Jenkins. I am Darren Jenkins, and joining me on the show today, Wallace Haman, a London-based actor who can currently be seen in the new film, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. Hey, Wallace, what's going on, man? Hey, it's nice to meet you, Darren. Yeah, it's good to see you. You know, you're in the UK. What time is it there now? 10 p.m. To me, I have been doing a lot of European actors recently. It's been it's been interesting. I actually had, um, did somebody who was from uh, Australia recently. Oh my gosh! Yeah, it was a serious time difference. I was like, yeah. "Wow, okay, are you up all this time? This time?" And he's like, "No, no, it's just he's like he's like I'm a late late, late person. It's all good." So I'm like, "All right, cool." Yeah, I've done been... four a.m. recently. So oh really? We're... Yeah, we you figure it out. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, sh- I mean, actors, we 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 have such odd hours, right? I mean, it's like, especially because you could be on a. I, I remember doing um doing a film for Spike Lee, and I remember the call time was four a.m. I was like, wait, what? Yeah. Okay. There's always that thing where you get your call sheet through the night before, and you're like, oh my gosh, ten a.m. start. That's so civilized. You're like, and like I can sleep. Yeah, and the way you do all these things where you're like, well, that means I could even get a workout in beforehand. Oh, or, yeah. And then, like, uh, what actually happens is you yeah, wake up yeah. at, like, 9.55. And you're like, damn it, I got to get out the door. Yeah, yeah. So where? So you're, you're, you're based in London right now, but where are you originally from? So I'm, I'm kind of a, a mutt, I guess, is the best description. I was born in the UK, but I grew up kind of all over the place. I between Dubai and Texas and Greece. And then wow. I went to university in uh, the Netherlands and in Switzerland and Boston. And then wow. I moved to the UK. Uh, then I lived in Belgium. Then I moved to the UK. Then I lived in California for a long time and Spain. You speak and- like tons of languages, right? I mean, French, yeah. Dutch, German, Greek, Spanish. Jeez. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's the the one nice thing about like constantly having imposter syndrome in a country that mm. you just moved to. You're like, how do I assimilate as quickly as possible? So, and being young enough to like learn those languages when I was still able to. I mean, my brain is a fossil now. <laughs> I can't learn anything. But back in the day, yeah, I was very fortunate to have that kind of nomadic upbringing, and it, it's it's been really useful for my work you know just being yeah, able to like going to ask you about this like how did how did that how did moving around kind of inform your decision to go into acting actually so i um uh, i'm not going to be able to answer your question because i never intended to be an actor oh really yeah i was a competitive figure skater and i huh. i competed for you know on and off 20 years and that was like my life's work. That was my passion. And it was all I ever wanted to do. And I was, to be clear, incredibly unsuccessful. Mm. I was constantly injured. I, I sat out more than I ever was actually competitive because I broke pretty much every bone in my body. But like, it truly was like that thing, that burning passion. I'd wake up every morning and that's all I wanted to do yeah. uh, at a certain point juncture my career i broke both my knees i mean i say that for dramatic effect i i basically dislocated my patellas so wow acutely that i couldn't actually put pressure through my knees so i wasn't really able to walk let alone wow. skate um and i realized when that happened that i had been so focused on this plan a i'd never come up with a plan b I'd never thought beyond the end of my career. I just assumed I was going to skate in some format for the rest of my life. And suddenly that wasn't the case anymore. So I kind of, I was living in San Francisco at the time and I, I decided I needed to go somewhere where I didn't know anybody where I would have to like, just have to sit alone and kind of percolate with my thoughts. So I went Mm. to Toronto weirdly enough for a few weeks and did exactly that. Like just shut everything down, shut out all the noise and started to figure out what I thought I might resonate with as career 2.0, I guess. And uh, 
the, what came out of that like meditation was that I wanted to explore something in media primarily with actually like hosting. I thought I might want to oh. be a TV host. I was like, I love talking to people. People seem to involuntarily tell me things they don't tell other people. I was like, I could be a spy or... <laughs> and that seemed like a lot of work. Yeah, shooting at people shooting at you. There's just a little downside there. Yeah, yeah exactly. So TV hosting seemed like the, the much easier career path. Right. No so, one's shooting at Jimmy Kimmel, right? Yes. <laughs> so I moved to the UK or back to the UK to do a course, like to get the basics, because I never worked in that kind of medium. And then started sports modeling on the side through a recommendation of a friend of mine, another former figure skater who was like, hey, this agency is looking to sign, you know, former athletes who are in good shape. And so they signed me. And then my first job that I booked ended up being on a TV show and someone on that TV show was like, hey, you you can act. You should speak to my agent. Literally, like the kind of stuff that you, like it's urban myth shit, right? right, right, right. Swearing. I don't know if I'm allowed to swear. Am I allowed to swear? Oh, yes, sir. Absolutely. Good. <laughs> kind of urban legend fucking shit, right? <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> um, that agent signed me the first three auditions they sent me out on I booked and suddenly I was like oh I think I'm doing this other thing now it's not the path that I had envisaged but it's something very cool and very interesting and also I like, kind of tapped into the same I guess the Venn diagram of of figure skating performance versus you know acting there was a huge overlap I just I had it never correlated the two but I was like oh I think mm. I, I instinctively know what to do I just need like like technique to figure out how to harness it right so then i started like you know doing some training and la di la di da and stuff just evolved and like by no means has it been an easy path there's been a right. lot of like you know frustrations and disappointments and things that didn't go my way that would have been incredibly life-changing but equally i very proud to say that like for the last you know 10 12 years i've i've had a really very interesting and wonderful career um wow. doing screen and voice work so like i i consider myself to be one of the lucky ones because i know mm. i know there are so many people who strive to work in this industry and it is it's a cruel cruel mistress and yes not very kind to a lot of us so Every win is a win, you know, and that's true for all of us. So, yeah, I count myself to be very fortunate. So it's, you're not the only former skater that has been who gave up their dream of skating and, and went into acting. Actually, I've had, it was, God, I can't remember who it was. It was one other person who came on my show, said exactly the same. They were like, I was, I was a skater and I just kind of fell into acting wasn't a plan, but you adapt and you move on, you know? Well, uh -oh. if that person is stealing my work, I'm a hundred <laughs> down. I want to know who it is. I want names. He's somewhere out there. Yes, I finally have got his career. <laughs> oh, my God. That's hilarious. Um, so how old were how old were you when, like, when this all – like? Uh, you want me to give up my real age on camera? No, you, you can insane? be. A... Come on, man. You, we all know you're. We know you're only twenty. Come on, right? So my playing age is fetus to forty. If any casting directors are watching this, <laughs> mm, there you go. I was in my early thirties. Oh, that's that's. There's, I mean, come on. That's isn't that what the thirties are for? Thir the thirties are for you to like, like the twenties. You just left. You let just left your parents' house, and you 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 you're you kind of messing around. And thirties is when you start getting ideas about what you want to do, and so most of what you want to do is either dangerous, crazy, hard to do. It's like you try the impossible things. You do all right. the things that are physically, because you know, like for most um, athletes, you know, thirty five is like, oh my god, thirty five is the end of the road. Oh my yeah. god, you know, when it's really not. I mean, give me a break. But for, for the general public, 30, 35 is like, well, if you're, if you're not done by 35, it's over for you. Yeah. You know, 
So, I mean, it's a hard thing as well because we're all the prototype is the generation before us. And yes. Oh my what God. What you my... get at 35, what the prototype was for a 35 year old typical life for a successful typical life. Yeah. You know, the house, the the marriage, the 2.0 kids, whatever. Yeah. You know, like we've been trying to unpick that learned behavior in this generation and and yep. ever since. By a, we're constantly like comparing ourselves to a standard that no longer applies to us. And yes, sir. Yeah. So it's, it's a tough one because, you know, by, by some weird infused idea of what success looks like, we've been fall we've been coming up short and then having to justify our existence to ourselves. Yeah. Right. Yep. Yep. My so, God, it's got very philosophical. Very hey, quick. I bring the deepness here. Okay. So how do you think, your idea of what you consider successful yourself has has changed from this from you know that time in life where you thought you're going to do this and now you're doing this has your has your idea of what makes you successful changed and if so in what that is such a great question. So, you know, it's kind of funny being a very unsuccessful figure skater meant that the bar for success for me was always really low. And I had to make my peace during my skating career of like recognizing that, like, I wanted to compete at the Olympics. That was the ultimate goal. I wanted right. to make the world championships. Like there were all these things that I wanted to achieve. I basically wanted to be the male Michelle Kwan, right? Okay. Hey. And genuinely, so there's no hyperbole here. I would wake up every morning with that, like, I'm going to get to the ice cream and land my triple loop. And, 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 and I had all this stuff. And so many times I would get to the ice rink and my body was so physically broken that I wow. literally couldn't push. And I would be like swallowing all these pills to try to like just mask the pain to get through a session because I wanted oh, wow. this thing so badly. But the flip side of, of that is that I learned very quickly that like every day I got on the ice was this incredible blessing and the outcome became completely irrelevant. The journey, just the being able to do what I love to do every day and striving towards a better version of myself on the ice every day, whether I achieved it or not, that, that's where the satisfaction came from. Mm. So mm. I say it was a low bar. It was actually like the perfect bar to, to be jumping over every day. It was a really nice hurdle to have in front of me. And I think in many respects, I've been able to copy and paste that into my acting career. Right. Although having started with a certain amount of like just ease, you know, it all happened very quickly and quite like, you know, within three months of being an actor, I was already on TV. And that's oh, wow. right. That Again, like I'm aware that that's not everyone's path that unfortunately lulls you into a false sense of security. Like it's always going to be like this. Hmm, right. So then, yeah. so then when it starts to get hard, when you're going up for bigger stuff and, you know, you're losing out to somebody who is more famous than you, you know, whatever that's that becomes a harder pill to swallow but i do think underpinning all of that disappointment when you think oh that guy's got more credits than i do or top a show for this guy you know he's making more money than me la 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 <laughs> i always come back to you're so lucky to be here this was never even this was never even the dream <laughs> like yeah. you got your 2.0 turned out so much better than you could have ever envisaged. Mm. And so like, you know, those moments where I do feel like that frustration, that always comes back. And that's definitely from just literally breaking my body, trying to be Michelle Kwan and not making it happen. So like the 2.0 is a gift, like genuinely a gift. As a former sports athlete uh, myself, uh, I can like, um, I think being being someone who's competed in some a sport that's competitive, I think truly makes you um, uniquely qualified in a lot of ways to be an actor because we are like you're it's so there's there's a competitive juices that are in you from your sportsness that you then take in place into the acting world and you know, you know let's make it real it's 
acting is kind of comp- it is very competitive. It is a competitive sport. Sport. I mean, it really is because there, are, like you said, I mean, not not everyone, not everyone gets a commercial, in the, you know, right out the box, and you know, and there are so many. There are only so many of roles that are fit for you, or this or for that. You know what I mean? And while you're not trying to tackle anyone or hit anyone or you know, uh, there's it's not timed. It's a competitive. You walk into that audition, you are compete. You're competing against the people in the room. You're competing for against the um, directors who are looking at you. You're com- you're competing against yourself in a lot of ways. Yeah, it's it's and it's very much it's it's a solo sport and solo it, sport and it's a marathon essentially. Yeah. So like a lot of the stuff that you that you're able to like learn the, the thing I think there are a lot of athletes who have successfully transitioned into acting yeah. careers. Yeah. Right. Like it, there's no it's not a fluke, right? Right. It's I think a lot of it is to do with as an athlete, you're given you you naturally have this drive, which and you know, this focus that you're able to tune into one singular goal. Right. And a certain amount of determination and also just resilience because you are constantly battling with, you know, your body with bad training days, with toxic coaches, whatever it is, (laughs) you know, (laughs) I was like, Oh, I'm about to say too much. Yeah. 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 But you know, like those two things and discipline, you know, those, you, you take those out of the competitive sports milieu and you put them, into any kind of professional setting, yeah. Yeah. you already have an advantage yeah. because we forget people who don't grow up competing in sports in that way aren't necessarily handed that kind of resilience or haven't built up that kind of discipline to be able to stick it out when things are hard or when things don't make sense or when the odds right. are stacked against them. Right. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. So, so once you've decided this. This is what you want to do. Um, like, so hosting is a different, like, I am like you. I, to be honest, I would love, it's my dream to have a, my own late night talk show. I would love that. I would be like. It's 10 p.m. here. You've technically achieved your dream. You I are know. winning at life. <laughs> That's right. I got my late night show. Hold on now. I need myself a sidekick and I'm good. I, you know, so when you, when you become, so when you start, so when did you, so if hosting was kind of something you thought about when you decided not to do that or went a different direction, did you call on, did you call on your experience watching different actors like in in movies on film and the to kind of kind of inform a direction for which you wanted to kind of go and if so like what actors would you know you kind of look at Damn, actresses or you know. they're really good I should lie <laughs> yes um, you can just tell us <laughs> the, the truth is traditionally haven't been very interested in consuming commercial TV and film or indie for that matter. I say commercial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, oh, I'm actually a real artist. I only watch, you know, foreign films with subtitles. I only no, watch I, the good things. Yeah. <laughs> it is not that. I, it's, this is, gosh. Uh, so as a skater, I, you know, like my training days were very long and it would be like you would have a 6 a.m. session. You need to skate from six to eight or nine, and then you'd have a break, and then you'd have dance training for an hour or two, and then you'd have a break, and you'd go back and do another session at the ice rink, and by then it would be like four or five p.m. Then you'd have like a dinner break, and then you'd go to a yoga class, and then you would stumble home, you know, throw some food down your gullet, watch something mindless on TV, and then you know, rinse, wash, repeat, right? Wash, rinse, repeat, and then. (laughs) um, so I got into this very kind of samey, I'd like to consume media that I have seen before because I need, it's comfort TV. Comfort television. 
Yeah. And it's like, I, I don't need to invest and I can kind of start to wind down. And yep. it's funny because I, I still do this. I only allow myself to uh, watch TV at night. Watching it during the day feels like this terrible sin. And I still <laughs> only watch primarily things I've seen before. It's very right. hard for me to commit to watching something I, I don't know. So, right. you know, like Friends reruns, you know, like, thank God it's in syndication. I can just throw yep. it on. I still laugh. I still think it's hilarious. I'm still very yep. invested. And there's enough episodes where, like, if you start from the beginning and work your way through, by the time you get back to the beginning, you've already forgotten right. what, right? It surprises right. you in a bunch of different ways. And then, like, then the gate that becomes like a gateway drug almost because then I'm like, oh, well, I love Lisa Kudrow. I'll watch all of Lisa Kudrow stuff because I, she's familiar enough to me that, like, I'll be invested in new stuff that she's done, but it also has that comfort. It still ticks the comfort. Sure, box. sure, sure. So I guess I'm trying to say, um, I was probably most influenced by Chandler Bing. Hey, but he's funny. He's I mean, very funny. You know, and I am not as funny as he is, but like I do think that kind of those kind of shows, that kind of sensibility, that kind of timing, because that's the the media I consumed the most over my career. Sure, sure, sure. Of the format and how I easily I was able to digest it, that has inadvertently just played a big part in I absorb scripts and how I end up interpreting them because it kind of goes through that filter. Hmm. But yeah, a lot of a lot of the time, especially in the very early stages of my career, everything was just pure instinct because because it started off so well with me just, you know, walking into an audition room and booking. Right. Like, well, what I'm doing is working. Just keep doing that. Yep. By the way, that also meant I made the most horrific mistakes in sure. very public settings and got it very wrong and really misread the tone of the piece, the misread the tone of the room, you right. know, like over-egged it, under-egged it, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I think maybe what was the key to me having early success was just purely the fact that I was doing something very different than everybody else because I wasn't trying to adhere to a vision that was, you know, in the ether. It was more like, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. I'm just going to show up and do me. Right, Whatever right. version of me shows up is, is what they're going to get. And hopefully they'll like it. And they did. Hmm. Now, as my career has progressed, I think I do, I do try to actively consume more stuff. Like if, so if I'm auditioning for a show that already exists, I will go watch the show. Right. Right. Um, right. And a lot right, of sure. time, yeah, but that's work. That's different. That's right, me. Right, right. Like, Research. You know, right. Yeah. I invariably end up getting very sucked in. And sure. then by that point, I'll have found out that, like, I didn't get the part. And then I'm, like, hate watching it. <laughs> He's going to die in this episode. What, what motherfucker? I... <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? First of all, you are not the only one who does this. I do this exactly the same thing. I get in things where don't I have to have something on that is... Not, I won't say mindless because that's not the right word, but comfort. I just don't want to think about it. I just want to watch and absorb it. And then, you know, like I watch Seinfeld every night. I have done that every night since 2003. And before I go to bed, I always watch it. Why? Because it helps my brain to unwind and kind of relax. And it's what I know. It's just something familiar. And, um, and it's a also, meditation of sorts. Yeah, because exactly. It allows you to like decompress and detach and kind of exactly. the back of your brain starts like processing the day. And it's, it's, I'm so glad you're the same because a lot of people think I'm crazy. And, and, you know, I would say to you that how you approach things in the beginning of your career was not different than, say, what happens to an athlete when he's in the zone. And when you're in the zone, you're not thinking about what you're about to do. You're not going, I'm going to dribble the ball over here. Okay, now I'm going to shoot the ball. I'm going to group. It's just, you just get into this thing where it's better for you to just kind of do it and think about it later. And because to your point, everyone else is doing the complete opposite of that. They're like, they, they, all right, I got to, I'm going to. I need to be a theater actor for three years before I do this. I need to do this. And that's fine, too. It's whatever works for you. 
but there's I think there's a there is a method that works for a lot of people where it's you just try it, just do it because sometimes just doing it comes some of the best results have come from people who kind of have are more action oriented versus sit down and write out the plan oriented or or mm-hmm. have a you know I think both have, both can be true at the same time. It just depends on your personality. Yeah. I mean, there's something to be said as well for like just the spontaneity of, right. of, of you know, just allowing yourself to, to get into that zone. And, and like, so I, and I know about you, but like, I hate highlighting my script. I, I don't want, I don't like my script to have any highlights on it for my lines. I don't like to write in the margins of like action points or any, I won't do any of that because I have a fairly photographic memory. And so okay. like, if I've committed that to the side of the margins, when I'm performing, I can see that. And then suddenly it's informing oh. every choice, which takes away all my spontaneity. Whereas if that's, if I'm working off a fresh sheet in my head, there is the, 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 the door is wide open for mirrors. Right. For, right. for just to go off piece in it. Listen, like going off piece often means you get it very wrong, right? right. right. But there's actually like, who the fuck are we to say something is right or wrong? Like right. in the moment, if, you, if you're able to follow an instinct, like you're doing your job, Yep. right? So, you know, like follow the rabbit holes. It may not end up being the take that they use, but like it's, it's a worthwhile experiment. And yeah, so I do think there's something nice about not being pres- prescriptive just being able to be loose with mm. things and, and able to like just kind of fly off the handle and see where that takes you right mm. yeah absolutely what 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 excites you most about acting uh, hmm. gosh i surprise myself when i act um, oh that's a good one <laughs> Uh, I know who I am, right? Well, kind of. <laughs> and I'm like, well, that's a fucking lie. What are you talking about? <laughs> no, but, you know, like, I'm stuck with me all day in all my messiness and insecurity and, and, and you know, drama. Right. And there's, when when something is going well, when I'm able to perform a character that isn't me, and then I... I lose myself for those few moments or when I watch it back and I, I don't recognize myself in something that's always just, it's so surprising. And like, I guess it's so weird because I've been in this game for, you know, 12, 13 years or whatever, but it still feels like I'm a newbie. So like the surprise always takes me by surprise. I'm like, oh shit, I do this. I'm able to like completely lose track of who I am. And, you know, I'm, I'm playing a, a refugee and, or I'm playing a terrorist or, right. you know, I'm playing a insane French homicidal maniac or whatever it is. Like, it's really cool to like lose sight of who I am and something and, and just be able to like distill the fact that there's a different essence to that person. And I just, I can't believe that I'm able to do that. Hmm. Hmm. That is, a, that's got to be a great feeling, uh, being able to surprise yourself. You know what I mean? I mean, that's kind of hard to do, right? I mean, yeah. like you said, you know, yeah. you know, you, you kind of should know you, but when you do something, you're like, damn, I did. Wow. Okay. Uh-huh. It's, you know, when you're watching different takes of like self tapes that you're doing and I, I know that I've nailed it when I start thinking of, when I start describing the character as, oh, he did this or he did that rather than, oh, I like what I did there. It's what he, like, it just suddenly becomes like, it th- immediately switches into third person. That's usually like my eureka moment. Like, this is, this is, right. I created something apart from me here. There's something, mm-hmm. there's something, there is value to this. There's something interesting happening here. What kind of characters do you find yourself uh, most drawn to? Who? Could you stop with the difficult questions? Jesus Christ. <laughs> What's with the gotcha moments? These are the these are the softball ones you want to cut. Let's talk about George Clooney later. Yeah, you want my uh, economic plan, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, well, the Teamsters 
don't want to endorse me. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the things that's really fucking exciting about my career and my story and the reason how it, the reason my career has turned out the way it is, is that I, because of the languages I speak, because of my particular look, I get to play a really wide array of things. So, you know, I can literally have a week where I'm auditioning to play an Arab terrorist and, you know, a, a, a CIA operative, uh, a British doctor, and you, I don't know, like a French taxi driver, like literally, and like their age range will go from 35 to 50. Right. So, and they're all multiple languages or whatever and different accents. And I just, I get to the end of weeks like that and just think, this is bonkers. Like there's no mm. other word for it. Like I'm having to pull back on so many different aspects of my career and life and I'd like to find these characters and to make them truthful, right? Right. And there's value in all of them. I, like there's the things that I think I get really excited telling political stories. So I'm in a, a fiction podcast at the moment called Central Intelligence, which is a BBC Radio 4 show. Yeah. And Cattrall's the lead in it, along with Ed Harris. Wow. Yeah. And it's extraordinary. And it's all about, like, how the CIA was formed and how often it fucked up in trying to become the, the institution that it is today. And it's mm. told through the lens of Eloise Page, who Kim Cattrall is playing, who was like a very senior woman in the CIA back in the 50s before, like there were a lot of women in government in that in that way. Wow. Um, yeah, political stuff. Just I love it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> I love, you know, growing up in the Middle East for such a huge part of my life and speaking Arabic and having been in uh, the Middle East during the first Gulf War, those stories hit hard for me. I really enjoy being able to, to, to retell that history through right. a dramatic lens. And I really love comedy. Oh, like, oh yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and the goofier, the better, but like <laughs> well-written comedy you know, it has a specific cadence, it has a timing, it has, when it jumps off the page and then you're able to make it work, like, there is no better feeling. Like, yeah. aren't we all on the planet to make each other laugh? We're like, we're all fucking clowns, right? Like, yeah. so. Yeah. Some people mm -hmm. are working harder at doing that than others, but we get into all that. I thought this wasn't going to be a political podcast. No. Um... Yeah, comedy. I, I'm. I, that's. I um, study sketch and improv, and um, I find myself. The thing about comedy is, I find myself using aspects of the things that I've learned through doing comedy in everyday life all the time. Mm. It is incredibly um, insightful. Um, it is. You know, if it's like you said, when it's done right, there's nothing like. There's a sketch that um, Stephen Colbert and oh god, who there was somebody, the, these two waiters who. Oh, it was uh, Greg Kinnear, wasn't it? Uh, oh no, or no, I can no, see it face. was um from the Office. Yes, yeah, Steve Carell. Morning show. Yeah, Steve Carell. That's it. And they're completely turned off by. Food. I've seen that so many times, and it still cracks me up every time, because the, it's just it's such an, a great example of great, perfect chemistry and timing. Man, it was just like, you know, you can't teach yeah. you. You try. I don't know if you can teach that per se, but I mean, that was just you know, it's always one of my favorite things to to, to see somebody do comedy successfully. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one of my favorite things actually to watch as well is blooper blooper reels from those like oh, yeah. <laughs> sitcoms, and you know, because I think it also brings into sharp relief when it doesn't work, right, yeah. or when it goes too far. But like it's again, like everything's timing, right? So when you when you, it's nice to get a, a look behind the wizards. Yeah. I was gonna say curtain. Is he behind a curtain? I can't remember. Yep, curtain. 
Okay, sorry, my, my Wizard of Oz lore is all over. <laughs> I'm a nerd, don't worry. Oh, good. Oh, good. Well, I'm very cool, so... Shut up, why are you laughing? I can be cool. Oh, no, you're definitely cool. You're cool. I'm in Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice... Tell us, tell us, tell, tell me, how did you, how did you get that role? First of all, I mean, I could not be more enviable. I could, I, I'm so jealous, man. Thank you. So it was casting out of the UK, and <laughs> it's funny because it was off tape, one tape. Oh, really? Oh, really? Which is, I know, but the. The character description, um, male or female, right? Twenty to fifty. Hey, they went why? That's, that's pretty broad. Well, yeah. So, and then they did two rounds. Like hmm. I would, I taped for the first round, and then I, a bunch of my friends started taping like a week later, and I was like, oh, right, I didn't get it. And at that point, I had no idea what it was. It was called Blue Hawaii. It was a feature film. It could have been anything. Um, okay. I assumed it was an indie with a name like Blue Hawaii. I was like, Blue whatever. Hawaii. Like, yeah, it could be anything. And it was dummy side. And I mean, I always tape in a studio. So like I went to my studio, we, we, we kind of fleshed it out half hour, you know, just put something on tape. I was like, yeah, I buy that. And then sent it off yeah and then my friends started taping and i was like oh well whatever and then a week later i get an email saying i've been pinned for the role of glenn and i was oh. like oh that's weird <laughs> i guess i guess out of all the 20 to 50 year old men and women in the country like i'm in the running crazy wow and then um that was on the thursday and I distinctly remember it was a Monday. It was 1.13 p.m. Like, it was all very clear. I was at the gym midway through a set, and an email popped in. And I have a separate email account for my acting work. Yep. And so, like, I always know when that email account pops off. I'm like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Springs Eternal. <laughs> and I saw, like, the subject line was Glenn. And I was like, oh, it's 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 the no go email. And then uh, and then it was like, congratulations, you've been booked for and I and I just it's so clear to me because I was just like the world kind of stopped, right? And I was like, I've been oh, Did I, you have to read it twice to kind of make twice, sure like twelve times and I screen grabbed <laughs> it and I sent it to my my friend and I was like, this this is I got the part, right? Like and it was just because it was only because I knew that, like, A, it was such a wide brief, and B, so many people had taped for it, and they got yeah. two rounds. It just, it never occurred to me that I was ever going to be in the running for this thing, not even knowing what it was, right? Like, right. I was still like, this is amazing. Whatever this incredibly bizarre brief with the fake sides, it, apparently I got the part. I'm in blue Hawaii. <laughs> right. <laughs> that wonderful indie about blue people. Shark. Shark that surfs, you know. <laughs> Literally. And then, great. Very excited. Well, you know, they'll come back to me with dates, la, la, la. And then my manager messages me, I think. I think it was him. And he was like, I'm Googling this. I think it's Beetlejuice. And I was like, ah. Okay, you know, no, it's Blue Hawaii. Come on. <laughs> it's no, it's Blue Hawaii. Like, and I was like. And then, like, that, that seed planted, right? And I was like, could it be? And I'm, like, Googling away. And I can see that there's, like, very loose links to Be Blue Hawaii having been used as a code name for Beetlejuice. But there's nothing mm -hmm. substantive, right? So, like, apparently that was when they were originally going to do a sequel to Beetlejuice in the early 90s or whatever. It was going to yep. be set in Hawaii. So that was, like, the whole thing. But, you know, it, wow. it was a very tenuous link. And I was like... I'm not putting stock in this because I haven't had any confirmation that this is right. anything other than an indie. So, right. um, that, so in the UK, it's standard. You get transport as part of your deal. 
So you oh, get wow. driven to set every day for every fitting for and driven home. You never have to take yourself to work. Well, I'm moving to the UK no more. Yeah. I know. <laughs> I mean, the first time I filmed in America, I was like, what you want me to make my own way to I, I, do you know who I'm not? A person with a license. I don't know how to drive. Are you insane? Yeah. So then I got picked up for my fitting, went to the Warner Brothers studios and went into my fitting room and up on the wall was a picture of Michael Keaton in his new Beetlejuice costume and Catherine O'Hara in one of her many yep. insane outfits. And I like it. It was like, oh shit, it's Beetlejuice. Holy shit. Holy shit. It's Beetlejuice. It, it, I, like you you dare to dream and the dream has come true, right? Wow. <laughs> um, and then Colleen Atwood came in to dress me and she had been my costume designer on Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. And so we oh. hadn't seen each other in about six years. And I was like, oh my God, this is incredible. And again, like weird full circle thing. Hmm. One of the lead costume people working under Colleen was a guy called Perry. Hmm. And my first ever job in film, my first year in the industry was as an extra. And he was, he the extras on this job. And I was on this job for three months. It was like the first time I've been on a film set. It was incredible. And like, actually a huge part of like, like my foundational training, just being able to sit on a set without right. any pressure of watching other actors work. Right. And so he had dressed me, you know, 12 years prior as an extra. And then... Oh. Now he was like one of the lead costume people on Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. And I was wow. one of the principal actors. And it was like, I was like, oh my God, Perry, like, this is crazy. That's... We've like, we've taken this journey together. Like we've separated and now we've landed back in the same spot again. And we're so much further up the road. And like, this wow. feels really emotional. You know what I mean? That's like, so cool. It was, it was just it, uh, like, just a reminder from the universe. If I may be woo, -woo that like, we were like, we're all making our way up this mountain and we're much further up and much closer to whatever summit might be up there than we had been 10 years prior. And like, it's worth taking stock and looking back and being like, oh my gosh, we've come this far. Right. Yeah. yeah. That is amazing. I mean, it, it also uh, underlines a thing that I always tell people is like, look, especially in the industry, it's a small world. You just never know who you're going to see up the ladder and down the ladder. So always be mindful of being good to the people around you because the next per that, that that person who was your PA back in the day might be your director next week. A hundred percent. And I mean, yeah, it's, I'd like to think being, kind to those around you should come a standard, but like some people need a reminding, right? Yeah, some people unfortunately need a reminder. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what was, was there anything that you thought, like what was, was there anything surprising that you found about the, uh, while, you, while you were on the set as far as working with the director or? or... Yeah. Um, Tim is, so trusting of his actors. Hmm. Like there's not a lot of like, I need you to do this and then let's talk about it. It's, it's not that. Huh. If you've been hired for your job, you are given credence and trust to do the job that you were hired to do. Hmm. And that's a great place to start from set. And, and again, like, you know, I, it's, it's interesting because like, I think uh, rightly so, the Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice character in the netherworld, in the underworld. Right. Are, I, I can say this, are more memorable than a normie. Because sure. I play a normie, right? Right. So, like, I, I, I you know, don't, I don't think of myself as the most memorable character in that movie by a stretch at all. Right, right. But it doesn't matter, because whatever set you're on is so perfectly created for that world that, like, I have to say, like, as an actor, I felt like I could do my best work just because I felt so immersed in the world that I was given to play. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. And it was like little things and it's stuff that doesn't necessarily make the other, you know, like, have you seen the movie yet? Not yet. Okay. I don't want to spoil anything, but it's just simple things like 
you know, the, the supporting artists, the extras who we had on set, like mm. just being given full permission to interact with them and use them as like, as additions to the scene to make the scene come to life. Right, right, right. It was so cool. Like, and again, like even the extras were perfectly cast. They, you, you had so much to work with. Yeah, it was, it, it felt it felt like a very three-dimensional experience. That's important. I think, especially when you're playing characters so specific, being able to be in that environment and make you feel like you're there, right. you know, helps you to really, really bring out the inner character, that inner character. Right. And then no acting required in a sense. Right. Right. Because you're just living in the moment. Right. God, that would be so cool to be on that set. Yeah. I mean, listen, I will also say, like, I'm very jealous of the underworld people, right? Because, like, <laughs> they got to do prosthetics and, like, oh, that's have true. things sticking out of them. And their sets are fucking insane. You know, like, if I found living in the normie world on a Tim Burton set that immersive, I can only imagine. With the prosthetics how, and all that other stuff. Like, how insane that must felt to look in the mirror and not even recognize yourself, right? Have you have you done like any prosthetic work at all yet? I have, yeah, yeah. and I've loved it. I mean, I'm fairly high octane, I guess. So like the the physical process of of being still while someone like does that to you requires me to like really have to like shut down. Yeah. Yeah. Like just go down to my basal metabolism so I don't lose my goddamn mind. And also like I just feel like I'm probably like a makeup artist's worst nightmare because I'm a little bit fidgety. But that said, <laughs> it's worth it for the end result, right? Like, yeah, you know, I played Beelzebub in a music video a few years ago and mm. they had done this like huge gash across my rib cage that was just so intricate. And it took like four or five hours to do. Wow. And yeah. And it just, you know, like it's that thing where you look in the mirror and you're like, I'm that looks so real. I'm a little worried that mm. I'm bleeding out underneath that. I would love to do some uh, prosthetic work. Or I've always wanted to do play the like a an evil villain or something. And to me, that would be the character that would draw me in, like a an evil character. Yes, yeah. I get to play them a lot in video games. I really enjoy playing evil characters. In video games. <laughs> so, um, gaming. How much gaming stuff do you do? You do? You, are you doing a ton of that? Yeah, yeah. I. Um... Like, I, I mean, again, like, I'm very lucky. Like, I get to bounce around media quite a bit. So, like, it's either film or TV or it's, you know, a fiction podcast or it's um, an animation or a video game. Or I do a lot of loop group stuff, again, because of my language skills. And, um, yeah, so video games have, have become a, a, a real fun part of of my... How did you get into, like, the... Vo like a this is voiceover work mostly, right? For yeah, gaming. Voice acting, yeah. Like how, how, how did that, how did you end up in the voice? Act? I, you're doing like all the stuff that I, I, I would love. I would kill to do some voice acting. Kidding me? That's awesome. How, how, how did you, how did you end up doing any voice acting? Uh, it started off because uh, I started doing loop group stuff because oh. of my language skills. So like what, I would go in and is, do a different voice. Huh? What is loop group? So like uh, going in additional, doing additional voices on film and TV shows. Gotcha. Um, so uh, sometimes revoicing actors, uh, sometimes adding voices to background characters, uh, doing, you know, news presenters, you know, that, those kind of things, um, wow. which is super fun. It's all improv based. So, you know, a lot uh -huh. of times they'll be like, there's two characters in the back there. They're walking across the street. We need to be able to hear a snippet of their conversation. And you go up and... You just make something on the fly. Sometimes you're matching the lip movement, um, oh. you know, so it, it's very technical, but it's entirely improvised. And so I do that in English, Arabic, French, and Dutch. So uh, that's, it's a really kind of, it's a very fun thing to do. And it's, mm. it's a lot of, it's a, it's a big part of my voiceover work. Um, and then, so because I was doing that, I got, um, I, I kind of caught the bug for doing voice acting. And then right. um, I think, gosh, and then I started, 
I was doing a play and somebody, a director, a fiction podcast director came to watch and was like, hey, we need an American for this thing I'm recording in a couple of weeks. I'd love to hire you. And I was like, great. And hmm. so um, I ended up working on that. And then um, so the the fiction podcast was uh, like a an audio version of the, the that 70s cult show Dark Shadows. Oh, I love Dark Shadows. Right. So there's like a huge, huge audio um, world that oh. is all based in Dark Shadows. And so like uh, they've continued the legacy of it. And it's all licensed by the Dark Shadows people. And um, it's huge fun. And um, so I end up doing a bunch of those because they, they write. Uh, you know, new stories all the time. It's a company called right. Big Finish. Um, and then, um, then from there, do you, is it, is it necessarily like the same agent that you, like, would you use the same agent for, or is there like a voiceover agent type person? Or is that... Oh yeah, no, that's all like a completely separate oh, voice okay. acting. Agent. Uh, yeah. Um, and so like, that was, that was my entry point into voice with the voice world and then i started going up for you know like uh cartoons and like you know narrating bits and bobs um for commercials and what have you and then then the video games took a while for me to get into like i auditioned for a couple years before i started booking them um and again like having language skills was very helpful hmm. and then um yeah it's I, the, the last couple of years, I've done some really cool games. You know, I've been in Starfield and Lords oh. of the Fallen and um, Battlefield and Dying Light 2. Um, I was just working on a game last week, which I, they're, and th the games are even more confidential than the movies. Like, you never yeah. know what you're working on. Yeah. So, like, you know, they, and sometimes, like, because you'll be working on something for months at a time sometimes you know like and you're just in and out like you'll do a session every couple of weeks or whatever and in the first session they're like oh you're working on blah 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 and you're like, great i'm working on blah blah, blah. <laughs> like and then it's never mentioned again and you're working on this thing for six months and then at the end of it you finish and you're like wait what the fuck was i working on <laughs> and then it's not going to come out for another two or three years and then suddenly you get an email being like oh the game you did blah 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 is out next week Oh, Remember, wow. you're still embargoed, and you're like, I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, like, I did that? Really? Okay. <laughs> and then, and then, like, you know, I I have a reel of like some of my more popular video game characters, which you have to trawl through gameplay on YouTube to find to assemble, right? So oh. that's a whole thing. Um, but like, you know, sometimes. I'll voice like 12 characters in a video game, you know? Right. 12 smaller characters. And then trying to find them as a nightmare. And then mm. a lot of times, because, you know, they'll record over years, they'll revoice you. They'll, you know, like something will change and they can't get you. So they'll get somebody else. Through. So you're still under the assumption that you're in a game and you go look up, <laughs> you know, Burt Hold in, I don't know, Final Fantasy 73. And then you're like, you're looking at Burt Hold and like you're watching Burt Hold's footage and you're like, that That's does not not sound like me. <laughs> um, do I have more rings than I realized, or have <laughs> I been replaced? <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, it's crazy. That's a whole crazy, crazy world. And it requires a lot of, like, just, again, like, vocal resilience, because especially yeah. things like Battlefield or whatever, you're just doing so much screaming. Uh, oh, my it's, gosh. Yeah everything shouted everything's very intense and it, it it really wears down on your throat is this I in mean, studio or do you do it from home mostly in studio i do a couple i do audiobooks from home i have a studio upstairs i have like my own recording studio upstairs but like i tend to just do audiobooks at home if i can occasionally the odd fiction podcast um over like the course of covid we did everything from home loop group everything yeah. um and that was just a, a technical nightmare in itself because yeah, then you're right. you're the voice artist but you're also the audio producer and you know like yeah i'm like i'm like the swedish chef with a computer it's just like oh, really? yeah yeah no that's a lot of hats to have to wear yeah 
for sure. And some people love that, but not so much me. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, but like, I'm, I'm uh, a regular on a animation at the moment that I'm just so passionate about because I play this completely psychotic monkey. Uh, Ooh. <laughs> like he's evil, but he's not as evil as he thinks he is. And he keeps like accidentally saving the day oh. <laughs> because he can't help himself. Uh, but he's completely Machiavellian as well and just unhinged. And uh, I mean, vocally, he's so hard on me because like he screeches so much and whatever, but, like he, it, like I, I almost pass out a lot of times like re recording wow. his stuff, but I don't give a shit because I fucking love him. He's like my <laughs> alter ego. <laughs> He's how like, do you, he, um, how do you take care of your voice? Like, cause I obviously, you know, when you're doing like these hard characters, you know um, what I mean? How do you, do, is it like hot tea and honey thing? Or? Yeah, there's hot tea and honey and like rest. I put myself on vocal rest a lot. So when yeah. I was doing Battlefield, I was working on it for three months straight and I was doing two sessions a week. Each session was two hours long and oh, wow. the lowest projection level was 80%. So wow. like they would have a percentage, a percentile they so it was like 80% projection level, 90% projection level, 100 percent So like you knew like, but like 80% for two hours in and of itself That's is a lot. just yeah. Um and so it was a very intense three months because I would record on a Tuesday and on a Friday, and I would then put myself on vocal rest on the days in between. Which is all good and well, but A, it's super isolating. Right. Um, and B, it doesn't account for any other work you get. So, and then, so like I would even like, I'd have to self tape on like the Thursday or something, and my voice wasn't fully recovered. Right. So suddenly you realize what an important instrument it is, right? Cause like, I'm like, yep. I'm trying to play this like dramatic character. I'm like, I just, I can't find enough, I can't give him enough voice to make him say yeah. what he wants to say yeah. and just you take it for granted how how much that informs your work as you're doing it on yeah. camera yeah. um yeah it was a very intense three months. i mean it was an amazing gig it was probably like my first big lead character in a video game and like i'm so proud of him but <laughs> it, it it definitely came with its downsides <laughs> uh what what advice would you have for young actors trying to uh, dive into the waters around this time? You're the second person who's asked me that today. That's so weird. <laughs> we um, want to know. Yeah, apparently I know the answer to this. <laughs> yes, you must have the answer. <laughs> so don't hold it. Um, oh, man. I think it's it's all advice I would give myself that I'd never take. <laughs> That's usually how it works, right? Yeah. It's, you know, I think it is worth remembering that it's a marathon, not a sprint that you, as if, if you can, don't compare yourself to other people because there is literally no one journey into this industry and there's no one career path that like you can emulate. Yeah. Each one of us has a very different, kind of footpath that they take. And, you know, some people's look like they're a straight line. Some people's look like they're much more winding and, but like they all have value. Um, I think work begets work. So yep. uh, I think it's important for people to not turn their nose up at an honest day's work or an opportunity. I'm not saying people should be working for free. I fundamentally disagree with that. But like, I also think um, you can make judgment calls. Like for a long part of my career, I would agree to do two free jobs a year, you know, either for a student or for a low budget production that I felt like the script was really great. The creators were really great. And they, they needed a good actor that matched what I was able to offer, but they didn't have the money for it. And if it didn't feel like a huge commitment and it mm. would help them out and I believed in their vision. Why not give them a day of my time, right? But also, like, 
have that boundary. Like I'll only do two of these a year. Cause if you do, if you're like, you're always open to that, then suddenly you're always working for free. And actually like that can be hugely detrimental to your mental health. Right. Mm. Um, so, um, yeah, I also think, um, it's important to just stay curious about what interests you and not be so locked and loaded on like I want to do drama or I want to do procedurals or whatever it is that you think that you are good at because right. again, like the miracles happen when you surprise yourself, right? So like being open to to figuring out different paths to get the I want to say the dopamine hit because I think mm -hmm. that's what it boils down to with actors, right? <laughs> like, yeah. You know, um, being so wedded to an idea of fame and success is equating to being on screen or being in, you know, this particular kind of show is, is bullshit. Um, hmm. Like, again, like just as somebody who gets to work across so many different kinds of, 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 of um, mediums, like I, can honestly say there is as much satisfaction and pride in the work and technique and skill required to do an animation voice or to do a fiction podcast as there is to be on screen. And you don't have to have your face in something for it to have value, right? So like liberate yourself from what the overarching idea of success is because it comes in so many different forms. And if you detach yourself from that like ultimate outcome you're more likely to actually find what you're good at mm. um and you know like just kind of going back to what you were saying about like were there actors that informed my work i, I actually think because I, I i work with younger actors and i coach i do some coaching stuff with them and i think a lot of times i see this thing where there's a real difference between somebody offering their interpretation of of, of of a script yep. versus somebody who thinks they are a Tom Cruise type who have learned how to do Tom Cruise acting. Hmm. So like, you know, and, and that's, that's not a judgment of Tom Cruise's acting. Right. It's more like right. they, they have, they put on the shell suit of Tom Cruise and they like, they know how to hit those notes the way he does. Right. But they don't ring true coming from another person. It right. feels like you're doing an impersonation of your favorite actor, or you're like, oh, how would Tom Cruise play this scene? That's how I'm going to play it. Right. And actually, yeah, it's great. Like, it ticks the boxes. You're hitting the beats. But, like, are you telling are you telling the story the way you would, right. you know? And maybe give yourself permission to, like, let go of what box you fit into. Mm. And let's see what, like your lived experience brings to this conversation, right? Mm. Yeah. Um, Plus, remember, if you do if you're doing Tom Cruise, who was Tom Cruise doing at the same time? Mm. Like then you're not really doing Tom Cruise. You're doing whatever mindset Tom Cruise put himself into at right. that point in time, which is not true to the character, obviously. Yeah. Exactly. It, but it's, it's a, I honestly, like I see it all the time with younger actors, mm. you know, and I, I get it. It's, it, yeah. you know, it's, it's technique, Yeah. but I think it, it undervalues what, what you bring to the table. Yeah. 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 So, you know, like give yourself a chance, you know, yeah. like, you know, don't, don't, you know, give yourself the credit you deserve. You're there. Yeah. So, and then the other piece of advice I think I would give is don't judge the work. You know, again, like this is something I come, I come across a lot as people being like, oh, I don't want to do soaps or I don't want to do mm. commercials or like, <laughs> like there is value in every piece of media that is produced and you being snobby about it is a reflection right. on you rather than on that media. You know, so yeah. people were like, I don't want to do commercials. But actually commercials are the entire reason we have broadcast television. If there was no <laughs> commercials, there would be no TV. Right. Like, so actually you, it almost behooves you to, to actively try to do commercials because yeah. it's the only thing that's bankrolling the TV show that you want to do or that yep. you like to watch. Right. So 
I, I, I like yeah. the commercials personally. I think I like the, the commercials that they have. They shoot today are so much more sophisticated than they were. You know, they're they're I, full you know. short films with a huge character arc. Yeah. And, stunts and incredible like they're amazing and a lot of the people working on those are really fucking successful film directors yeah like again who the hell are we to judge it i mean they're creating universes character universes now because like look at the geico commercials they've created whole universes around characters for these i mean that's that's no small thing man nope nope um, it's, uh, yeah, but I mean, I'm sure you've met those people too. Oh, oh don't yeah, want to absolutely. Them. It's like, what? It's like, <laughs> that's not really for me. I'm like, well, then you're missing out. Let me tell you. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, and another thing are like that people who are like, oh, I'm not, I'm not a commercial actor. I'm not good at doing commercials. Well, you know what? Get good at doing commercials. Let's go say, <laughs> we'll start practicing. Yeah. And I, again. And again. Because there are a lot of feature film directors who are directing commercials and they will see you and go, yeah, you know what? I'm, I'm shooting so-and-so next, you know, in, in the month. I'd love to have you audition. Yeah, it's happened. That is, now that's not an urban legend. That, no, shit that happens definitely happens. Yeah. Yeah. I, and also, like, people really watch commercials. They remember yeah, commercial actors. It's it's bonkers. Yeah. I've been recognized on the street more for a commercial I did in 2010 than mm. for Fantastic Beasts. Really? That's yeah. crazy. I but mean, the Fantastic Beasts family is, is like it's, it's its own animal. Like when you like, I'm doing a Fantastic Beasts uh, convention uh, next month. You know, a meet and greet with fans and signing autographs and all that stuff. And it's but you know, like they. The, the the Harry Potter Fantastic Beast fandom like congregate to those spots because like that's a sweet spot for them. That is right. their universe, right? right. Um, so that's what that's their time to shine. But yeah, um, the, the 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 I just the watched that them. movie. Oh really? Yeah, like like four days ago. <laughs> well, I guess you must be my biggest fan now. <laughs> yeah, I was you don't like, remember me in it, do you? <laughs> That, that's not good, man. That's my job. <laughs> no, you're all right. You're all right. What character uh-huh. did you play? I played one of the Aurors. I was Seraphina Pickery's right hand. Wait, hold on. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. I have my wand right here. You have a... Oh, you got you a wand. Me now? I remember. <laughs> Literally, I, seriously, I just watched it like um, Sunday, I think Sunday. That's crazy. It's yeah, actually, I, I really love that. It's one of my favorite f- films. So there, you, there you go. It is awesome. I'm very. Man, I'm so jealous of you, dude. I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very aware. I've been very lucky. I'm what? Really um, what's a piece of what's what's the what's a piece of advice um, that? Uh, someone once give you gave gave you and and who a good piece of advice because bad oh. you don't want bad advice. God damn it! Another gotcha question. What's wrong with you? Yeah, no. Uh, <laughs> I, have, I have problems. Uh, God, what is a good piece of advice that someone's given me? There's one at the tip of my tongue, but I like I can't remember how she phrased it. Now, like I'm afraid I'm going to say it wrong. I think it was, <laughs> it was something like very simple, like when when you're when you're on set, talk slow but walk fast, or it was the other way around. <laughs> maybe it wasn't very good advice because I can't remember it now. <laughs> but maybe it was talk fast and walk slow. That sounds no. Like I think simple. it was the other way around. Talk was it? Slow and walk fast. Talk slow and walk fast. Oh, that might actually, yeah. Well, that's probably the one because on a set time is money. Yeah, and that was my friend Heather Tracy who gave me my first ever book of acting, 
about screen acting by a man called Patrick Tucker on my birthday in June in 2010, right after I started in the industry. And wow. that, in, in that book, there was a whole chapter about like your first time in a speaking part. And it taught, God, I'm getting emotional now. <laughs> um, it's very late. We'll blame that. Um, <laughs> no, but this is so significant. I remember like reading this. I read the book cover to cover twice. And there was this chapter about the first time they put a radio mic on you and like how to modulate your volume when there's a radio mic on you. And then the next month, I booked my first speaking part in a movie. And it was just one line, but I remember them putting the radio mic on me. And I was like, I was just reading about this a month ago and now it's wow. happening. And it was like this, I was like, this is crazy. Like it honestly felt like I had made the whole thing up. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. Thank you, Heather Tracy. She's awesome. <laughs> he is really awesome. And so a phenomenal what, actor in her own right. What's next for you? Um, <laughs> what is next for me? <laughs> um, so I'm still working on my cartoon, so I'm back in next week to do some more on that. Um, we're halfway through season two. And, uh, yeah, I just finished that video game, but I don't know what it is last week and then i probably have to go back and do a little bit on that um mm. and other than that i'm just auditioning just, um mm. and like doing loop group stuff because that like i just i did loop group today on tuesday and yeah oh uh, wait there's something else definitely doing something else i can't remember <laughs> the, the calendar reminds me the day before. <laughs> yeah, there's just a lot of scripts in my head and I can't always like think of important things. So it's like eat dinner, show up on set tomorrow. <laughs> Sometimes you have to put those in the schedule, don't you? you have to? Right. Yeah. No, but that's that's kind of what my uh, my next few weeks are looking like. And then doing that, um, the Ironton Wizard Fest in Ohio. Uh, in Ironton, Ohio, which is one of the coolest places on earth because it is uh, uh, a tri-state area. We 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 do our event in Ironton, Ohio, but our hotel is in Ashland, Kentucky, and all our meals are eaten in Huntington, West Virginia, because um, <laughs> they're all like 10 minutes drive apart. <laughs> oh, wow. That's kind of cool. Yeah, it's a very fun part of town. Okay. Well, yeah, I've so never be been there, but uh, huh? I'll take. I've never been there. I will take your advent. I will take your uh, word you for should it. Come to Ironton, Ohio, and I will sign a fantastic <laughs> beast photograph for you. You know what? You can have it for free. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's so. I have. I used to do. Um, I used to be a comic book artist, and um, oh wow back when I was in high school and college. And uh, I remember doing a fair amount of those comic cons and cons and it was, you know what? Some of the best experiences I've, I've, I've ever had. I mean, it was just fun. They're really fun. They're intense. Yeah. They're, oh, yeah. They're definitely intense. I took the one thing that like the big learning thing for me from doing comic cons is how much the stuff that we get to appear in mm -hmm. affects people's lives. Oh, like, yeah. you know, you're working on a movie and for you, it's a very personal thing and you know, it's your paycheck and it's, it's your career and it's your progression and la, 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 la. Great. Yep. And it comes out and you spend all that time, like, hyper analyzing your performance and oh i moved my eyebrow wrong in that scene and blah 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 you know and yeah. oh my god i'm getting so old and whatever you know waiting through your own shit and then you go to a comic-con and a fan runs up and bursts into tears in front of you because i love you so much and uh you know i've i've, I've watched that movie 73 times yeah and you know 
it, it may be the thing that got them through bullying, you know, in yeah. high school. They yeah. could be somebody who is in a wheelchair and so they don't get out very much. So the media they consume is them going out into the world, yeah. right? And so for them, it's like it's it's teleportation at its most basic level uh, yeah. or, you know, they may be on some sort of of neurodivergent spectrum. So for them, like them watching a fantasy film, like they feel that in a way totally different from somebody who is neurodivergent, right? Yeah. Like we as the characters in those um, programs are very real to them and mean so much to them. Yeah. And suddenly it flips the script because suddenly you're like, I have a huge responsibility every time I make something to make it as good as possible because it could, it could be somebody's best friend, that piece yeah. of media, could be somebody's best friend. Yeah. And holy shit, maybe what we do is important. Yeah. Like we're and, not doctors, and... we're not nurses, you know, but what we do has value. And again, don't judge the work. You yeah, know, I mean, it might help them form communities where they feel comfortable, where in, in normal school or where they don't feel as comfortable. It helps them find a community of around this content that helps them feel like they belong somewhere, you know. For so, sure. Yeah. yeah. So I'm very so, grateful for those experiences because it definitely gave a wider context to like the just being on the hamster wheel of I need to book a job. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh before we go, I have one one last fun question for you. Um what what's your go to um karaoke song? <laughs> <laughs> oh god oh um <laughs> i'm laughing because i have the footage on my phone and my <laughs> friends never let me live it down because i am a terrible singer um but it's um <laughs> uh elaine page and i think it's barbara streisand I know him so well. Huh. <laughs> okay. It's a, it, there's not a single note in that song that is within my vocal range. <laughs> uh, well, that's but, what karaoke's for, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, at a certain point, like, give up the <laughs> song, man. But nope. I'm convinced that one day I'm going to be like, oh, no, I have a perfect falsetto. What are you talking about? <laughs> so is this a song that you choose when you're there or do, do your friends choose it and make you sing it? Oh, no, no, no. I, I Oh, you I choose it. Head on into the battle. Oh, okay. Like, <laughs> I'm like, everybody sit down. I got this. I'm, I'm a win. <laughs> yeah. I have, I have a few friends like that too. Like he'll like, all right, here, sit down. I'm about to sing. <laughs> Yeah, we're it's a special breed. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's all good, you know. It's like it, like going to karaoke is like going to Vegas. What happens in that room stays in that room <laughs> until so, your friends film it and post until it. Until your friends so. film it, put it on Instagram, and then yeah, it's all yeah. over. <laughs> well, this was so, this was so much fun. I really appreciate you uh, coming and talking, and this was I, you know, I came up with a couple. Good questions, but um, you know, you you kept batting them back at me, so I'm good. It's all good. Uh, this was really really fun. It was very nice to meet you and talk to you. Um, and for anyone who wants to, you can follow him on Instagram at Where's Wallace. Yep, and at Where's right Wallace down there. And uh, of course. While you're there on Instagram, please follow can follow me, the Darren Jenkins. Support the podcast. You're welcome to come back anytime you want. Thank anytime you. Anytime you want. I'm gonna take you up on that. I have things coming out next year that you might wanna talk oh, about. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I mean 
I love me. You like me on a cliffhanger. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Wallace, thanks so much, man. I really appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Have a great night. All right, you too.